Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our today's sustainability webinar. I'm Kavya Manjana, Policy and Project Officer with Train Producers SI. Today, we are going to be digging below the surface into the soils, particularly soils on the flora. So why we are doing this today? Well, we know that sustainability underpins everything that we do as a green industry. And with that in mind, GPS received a grant from the Hills and Fluoro Landscape Board to its grassroots grants program 2020-2023. Uh, well, uh, we hope this webinar will support the grain growers and mixed farmers in the Fluoro region by equipping them with essential skills in data management, mapping, and integration. Soil health assessment will be a key focus of today's webinar, as well as uh, moisture level analysis and strategies for minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. So we'll start with, so it's a fully packed agenda for today's webinar. So we have the virtual crop video with Michael Ayers from Field Systems. Thanks to Tim from Daylight Breaks for all the videography and editing. And then we have Sean Masson from Agronomic Solutions who is gonna brief us getting soil mapping and development scientific research projects. And then Brian Hughes from Pulsa who gonna speak about the concentration for soil health. And then we have Oli from Farm Lab who gonna speak with the soil sampling and testing and also the, the project that is associated with GPSI. We'll save all the questions until the final session. If you do have any questions during each presentation, please make sure you pop it in the Q&A uh, box below when you think of it. We'll collect all questions and put them to our speakers later on. Uh, you won't have the opportunity to turn on your mic on and ask the questions live. So please make sure you use the Q&A box, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that we are after questions we can all learn from and not the statements. We are now going to hear from Michael Hart, who is going to take us on a virtual crop walk and soil pit dig at James Stacey's Langhorn Creek property. Farmer Fletchley, um, which is three k's from here, so that's pretty similar soil types to this sort of neutral pHs, and then we've got the block at Brinkley, which has got everything under the sun from like yeah, that's your tiger country, yeah, brown sort of um, limestoney country to white beach sand to grey sand to some red dirt on that as well. So there's some pretty is that block there? there? I mean, I sort of know on that main road. That's yep. where. So has there much salt feeding in from the west yeah. on that side yeah, into that it, so it that does yeah have salt sort of yeah, marshes okay. on it. um and yeah you get that influence because obviously ferries mcdonald national parks above yeah it. and then there's some cleared land with the white sand and the sort of water comes through that pretty quickly like yeah like last year with the wetter years like we had some water coming out the bottom of the white sand hills into those salt pans it was amazing you'd get once that was really wet you'd get yeah. a good rainfall event and there'd be water coming out the bottom of them so yeah it's that's a different environment completely to so here you've put manures on that there haven't you yeah, like chicken yeah. manure and things like yeah, that and yeah. compost and yeah. you're obviously sitting right next to Pete's yeah no they... um, the chicken manures come from the chicken sheds over at Monado yeah. so we're trying to improve those soils by getting crop to actually grow on the sandy stuff and try and build the soil yeah up. it's a non-wetting getting worse there there's patches there that are actually quite significant yeah on our farm we're pretty lucky there's probably out of the sort of 1450 acres we crop there's probably only a hundred of really crap sand yeah um, okay and yeah the non-wetting like with our seed hawk like a um, precision seeder it's yeah done a pretty reasonable job of getting a good germination of it the main issue with that sand is brown grass on it yeah okay that is a bit of a challenge because that's pretty competitive with your crop if you don't control it yeah so how long have you had that block that's only uh, two or three yeah, years we've, we've leased it um last season and this is the year is the first year that we actually own it so we've had two years at it so far so. yeah okay so on so the bletchley block and here your yep. rotation you're using legumes cereals yep pasture yep right oh, and you cut hay as well yep. obviously yep. a fair like, bit of hay it's a fair bit of our business is hay and silage as well but this block here has had a long history of medic so there's fairly uh, good underlying nitrogen levels from it but now we're in a three-year cropping rotation of one-year legume and two-year cereal so 
Um, this will be beans next year, um, and then I might even try some lentils here, I think. Have you grown lentils here before? No, no. And lentils, I think, will grow okay here. They should, pH is, is good for lentils. Look out at Brent, they were using vetch as a legume. Yeah, yeah. They're cutting that for silage or hay. So in managing that landscape, so you do, you collect soil samples, you yep. do obviously yield maps and those sort of things, do you make any assessments there or have you done any subsurface like EM38 or we, anything like that? We do um, soil testing and we have done over the new property and here. Um, like we're using a contractor and we haven't got yield maps at this point but hopefully over the next year or two we will be having a header that can reap all the crop that can do yield mapping yeah. on it, which I think is Do you use biomass imagery and things that you kind of know? I know, obviously, when you're going uh, over that country. Um, but Zach, my youngest, he's been looking at that kind of stuff, but I haven't actually looked at that. And that's the, the key to this whole thing. I think you need to actually dig some holes, get some people who know what they're doing, and give you advice on what you should do to try and improve the soil. Because that was, Matt highlighted the fact that um, yeah, you can get your soil amelioration wrong. Um, you need to do what's going to suit your environment the, the, the best. Mm. Bletchley's similar? Yep. Or is that more kind of alluvial? Is that, that's... Uh, Bletchley's um, probably a heavier loam. Um, it's more of a clay loam, whereas this is a sandier loam here. So, Because we sort of, it's quite, as the your soil comes out of the hills, it, um, there's a bit of sand on the hills and it goes to some hard red ground and then it goes yeah. to lighter red soil and then into the black alluvial soil. So we do have some sort of ancient river influence on some of our farm but not a huge amount of it. So, yeah. Because this was mountains in the background at one stage yeah. and all the outwash and everything's coming through here. So the um, there's two river systems, or the Angus runs to the right back, you're just us. here and then the Bremer, Bremer comes in, yeah. obviously Callington. Yep. That way, that's what you, the old river systems, there's yep. still a creek in them, yep. but yep. that's, so it's an ancient, yeah, river system. And then it crosses obviously over to Brinkley, which is, um, yeah, completely different geology and yep. everything like that yep. in relation to, but there are sand seams here, silicious sand and that, I think, yeah, but that like, doesn't touch you at Bletchley. Like, no, but as you go over the rise here, there is a sandy rise that's got native pines growing on it, which they need to ah, okay, yeah, yeah. grow. So, and this property here is protected, sort of, it's almost a sand dune to the to that side of us. So yeah, okay. it gets protected from the wind that direction, and then it's there's trees on this side as well. So, it's a this this property only being three k's from our other property, Bletchley, but this potentially can yield twice as much in a dry land year. Yeah, okay. Purely because it's less Im influenced by wind here and it's better soil as well. So. Yeah, okay, it's only three kilometres yeah, away. It's, it's amazing how the rain could change. Well, that's kind of the mosaic between farms, but then there's a mosaic inside, Yeah. you know, each paddock and yeah. inside each, yep. each of the farms yep. that you're running. Yep. So in relation to the soil information that you would collect to make, you haven't done pH mapping or anything like that, have you done no, across only, a... Only on the irrigation block that we've got that sort of real detail on it. Yeah, um, would you look at doing that in these yeah, yeah, broad probably, acre system? Probably here. Brinkley's probably the more inconsistent block that you sort of need to know more about. Yeah. Um, whereas here, it would have some value, but this is probably far more consistent in terms of the overall whole block. Like we know there's this section here is a bit sandier, it's a bit weaker, so we've spread chicken manure on it to improve it. Um, what yeah. sort of rates of chicken manure? What about uh, here? About 12 tonnes a hectare. Oh, that's, so. a, that's a lot of chickens, yeah. 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 And you've seen a response in relation to that? Yeah, yeah. no, definitely grow more biomass and um, improve the crop as well. So you can improve the, if you get a better crop growing one year, that'll continue on over the next few years as well. So. Yeah. We usually notice, yeah, larger volumes of chicken manure or appropriate volumes, and then over yeah. time it actually starts to accelerate change in your favour. Yeah, yeah. So and it increases, it yeah, doesn't. And out at Brinkley, we've seen like where we've gone really hard on some really crap ground, but the ground next to the crap ground that's got big application rates, like you get really good protein in your barley and stuff like that. So it does. There's a, and this year, like we've grown a lot more biomass over the whole lot purely because of the underlying fertility there that's that you can't get from um, out of the back of a truck and, and pelletised fertiliser. 
So in relation to soil management then, if you were to put a hat on, would you say your changes in soil management and what you do into the future are based purely on production and short term kind of interest of making money, you know, short term, or are you kind of looking more long term, oh you've got two boys and whatever, coming back to the farm, but when you do something, do you look at it, say if you're putting out chicken manure, do you think oh, I'm going to get seven years out of that, 15 years out of that, or that's just part of kicking this system over for a, a much more sustainable? For Yeah, well the whole idea is to have a improve the business going forward and if you've got more productive land forever well that's that you, know, you need to keep working on it all the time to make it better um, as time progresses it, you want it to keep improving like because there's like the value of land's not going down like it's going up so you need to get the most out of what you've got yeah because sometimes it's hard when you talk about doing different things and people look short term in soils and say I just want a response now yeah. and those sort and of things and like, sometimes like you look at a, like a sand blowout and you go and put 20 tonnes a hectare of chicken shit on it like that's not necessarily a terribly viable thing to be doing in terms of what you'll get back off it in the next one or two years yeah. but if you are improving it for the long term well then it, it can generate you money back because it is expensive like um, to do things to improve the soil can be very expensive, like soil amelioration, deep ripping and stuff like that can cost a lot per hectare. Yeah, you've got to make the right decisions. Yeah, yeah. So to get a handle on it and ask James some fairly direct questions here, um, I'd say in relation to carbon, the obligations, and we uh, carbon neutrality as a nation and then as an industry and agriculture and that, do you ever actually think about that in terms of how you manage your landscape now, I mean, you're, like, whether you are or not contemplating going into a carbon project or anything like that, but it's it's a big issue and it it's not an issue that's going to go away. And each agricultural producer needs to have a plan. But do you have a plan in that space in relation to possibly the markets coming at you and there's carbon border adjustment mechanisms out of France or whatever, or there's just something that's going to play merry hell on you having an impost on your grain to export it or something like that do you think in that space well, now in yeah i think like, obviously a lot of australian canola goes into the eu so and they're going to be the ones that are going to put the most pressure on us to comply with their rules whether they're bullshit or not yeah. that's just how it is um as a farmer i look at the carbon farming stuff and go like i don't know what impact what requirements are going to be on our business down the track so there's no way that I'm going to be involved in a program to sell any of my carbon that potentially I'm going to have to use yeah because like and realistically in a cropping system to actually store more carbon in Australia has been proven so far to be fairly challenging so realistically the only option we'll, we'll have is is through vegetation and and reducing our emissions on our irrigation and our fuel so um, like on our irrigated lucerne we've put um, got 30 kilowatts of solar and we'll probably put another 50 kilowatts of solar uh, in to okay. reduce our, our carbon impact there but in reality the um, the carbon in our cropping system, like we could potentially do some revegetation on some properties and store mm. carbon that way. But yeah, like I'm aware that we might be having to account for it, and and that's why I don't think any farmers should be selling any carbon because you might need it for your own business down the track. You may have to buy it back yeah. in order to meet and, those and, obligations. And if you signed a contract at 25 bucks a ton, and you're buying it back at 150. You'll, that doesn't make much sense. No. And there may not be lenience in that space yeah. over time, and there may. But I just said, from my perspective, a soil's perspective, carbon is immensely valuable in the soil. Yeah. And so I know, say, Brinkley buying that land and you're putting the chicken manure and manures into that and carbon. And we do, second to the carbon trading system, have to engage with carbon as an as asset, yeah. Yeah. and it's a key asset yeah. in our farming system, carbon to depth. So it's kind of a bonus if you were trading or accumulating carbon for the value you're explaining. We still need to be in that space, and like, we like. I don't think it would hurt to do some baseline carbon testing, but 
and like just so have, have we have a baseline and then in 10 years time if they, the system changes and we have to account for more we can show something but I just don't know what path to go down to, to get that to happen in get, how to engage in that process without actually committing to something at the other end. Yeah, they're long-term obligations, yeah, yeah. so you have to be. But farming is a long-term yeah, obligation, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was only you got boys coming home, so they're yeah, yeah mm. that's long, long-term yeah, like they obligations. Might, they yeah. might not be thinking about it, but I think it's important that yeah. I am and, and sort of they understand that as well. Good to have a look, sort of below the surface, in relation to what James was saying, with this uh, sandy loam over the heavier clay, and he was talking about. His other, or another farm he's got here, only three k's away, uh, where the clay's closer to the surface, if you like, and it's a heavier soil. It's quite free draining on the surface, down to about 30, 35 centimetres before you actually hit that clay, and then going into the clay, just digging kind of the peds out of there. There's a huge amount of termite activity in there to depth, worm activity to depth, but the important thing here is the root activity down deep into that heavier clay as it shrinks and swells and obviously expands when it's wet. So this sort of country would be awesome in relation to drier sowing and cracking and fracturing and getting a seed into it with a tine, I'd say, in this soil type, definitely. Sandy loam, but it's bloody tight and hard. You know, it's, it hardens up when it's dry fairly quickly, but it's a very fertile soil. If we look at testing the pH to depth, here to be reasonably uniform going down into that heavier clay. Putting the barium sulfate on the powder. Yeah, it's probably there, it looks to be. Yeah, it is quite uniform. That's still at about six and a half down here. You look 30 centimetres, so, and largely. The same, so you've really got two, two and a half feet of the same pH, which is actually quite rare. Maybe some localised, there's a bit of non-wetting on the surface here, just from accumulation of organic matter, so it's probably more water repellents than true, like a non-wetting effect. But that's actually pretty cool to see the same pH. A little bit uh, lower in pH towards the surface, that's just lightening off a bit now as it reacts with the atmosphere. But what James is talking about growing lentils in here, he hasn't before, but you could, yeah, if you're running at that sort of pH. Um, this landscape changes fairly quickly. So, but just where we were standing then with James, and we're only 30 metres away, the soil he's talking about there is, is this uh, soil that's had two cereals in it, or oh, three cereals now, it's got the barley in it. And luckily, just in relation to the landscape here, just the softer, finish the rainfall, small misty rains, one or two mills coming back off that lake system. The big lake, it just stops the drying out here. And so, hence why three k's away from the other block at Bletchley, you do have more capacity to grow bigger crop here in largely similar soil types. So great to see. I, the big issue in ag is we can measure information across a landscape, that's spatial information, the changes across a landscape. So many ways of doing that now. On the fly, yield protein mapping, EM38, we're looking at you know gamma radiometrics, we're doing it that way. There's different ways, we've got surface pH mapping, EC, conductivity and so as we can measure all that spatial change, we then measure temporal change or change over time in a landscape, so from one year to the next or testing every three years or whatever. But the thing, the third cog in that wheel, so we've got the X and the Y axis, what we're missing is that Z axis, which is your horizontal change in a soil. Uh, but very general here now, it needs more time to investigate obviously, and you need to then get data, but we need spatial, temporal, and horizontal put together. But we can map with NDVI, we've got all the satellite imagery, the free to air stuff, the stuff you pay for, it. that's not necessarily expensive. We have immense capacity in this state to deal with what we need to, to cover off on those spatial, temporal, horizontal differences to make small, subtle changes across the landscape in our farms within our own budget framework in a farm to enact positive change. And we're not probably doing it as well as we should. 
serious talent pool, plant scientists, soil scientists and agronomists and everything in the state. The capacity is there, definitely, it's just our capability that we need to change. Thanks to Michael and James for showing us around there. Certainly plenty to think about. We move on now to Sean from Agronomy Solutions, who is going to give us an overview of soil mapping techniques. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity. I guess a nice segue there from Michael into uh, data layers uh, and I guess getting the most out of uh, our soil sampling programs and interpretation from the lab. Um, now, the next table. I was just going to start. These are my thoughts only. Um, always happy to hear feedback on my thoughts, but uh, I guess this is where we can start. Michael's listed all of these. These are data layers that um, have varying uh, skill level, I guess, um, costs associated with that and, yeah, obviously resources. So I was just going to walk through very quickly an example of all these and how we can actually get um, using these data layers to get a really good soil pre-season um, sampling program and matching that um, with those zones in, in matching the soils with the plants. So um, we can get those mechanisms together. So starting off, uh, yeah, this was just an example. This is a mid-north property, but this we can do this anywhere. Um, obviously a Fleurio um, webinar. So this was just an example of landscape changes um, with Google Earth, so uh, bare earth on the left. Um, an in-season capture in the middle and another in-season later capture on the right-hand side. Uh, just hugely powerful for me, um, looking at how those soil types, um, Michael talked about the horizon um, changes, but at the surface actually looking at uh, different soil types and how the actual crops are behaving if you can get an in-capture, but um, also good to sort of check amelioration processes as well, um, pre and post, so you can actually go back in time um, with Google Earth, uh, it is quite powerful. So just as a really quick example of this property and what we were doing, uh, we were using this paddock, the triangle paddock uh, for a site, um, a response trial. Um, and I yeah, intensively sampled, we're looking at site selection. So sort of a grid mapping approach, but um, you can see that sort of lighter gray area there in the middle was coming back pH 7.8. Um, so implications already at the high pH with potentially carbonate present in our country. Um, again, in that night, next brightest spot, 7.8, so continued uh, soil type there. We change for well, not even probably 100 metres down south uh, to the southwest. We've got a neutral, um, quite a good or well, a better um, darker soil, but uh, the crop is actually performing better there at the pH. So obviously implications with nutrient interactions. And then again, a couple of really good data or growth areas coming back at slightly acidic. So you can just see the spatial variation very quickly over a paddock um, using a Google Earth, so generating potentially some sampling zones already um, just from a very simple data layer. Another one Michael mentioned was NDVI. So um, various platforms of NDVI, um, some are free and I tend to see that the free ones have got the spatial um, information enough to make zonal decisions. So um, this is just looking at an example of pairing Google Earth with NDVI. This was a paddock on York Peninsula um, suffering from, well, acidity and alkalinity, I guess. So um, just a Google Earth image in the middle, we've got um, our red, nice red productive line um, down that southern portion, central portion, and also to the east of this paddock. Um, and hopefully you can see very quickly, there's a couple of those gray patches already popping out um, towards the northwest of this paddock. So again, looking at a couple of zones, um, this is actually a paddock located by Brian Hughes, who you'll hear about, um, and checking sort of line re responses. So that actual, um, yeah, red line with being productive, agricultural practices has driven acidity. But these soil types here with the gray calcareous uh, signature has actually maintained and really well buffered pH. So we're still, again, at that pH seven. So matching that paddock with a couple of NDVI layers, um, really powerful to look at different crops, so crop rotations. So uh, week 2019 at the bottom, lentils 2020. So we know Pulses can't really handle acidity very much. Um, if we didn't have that sort of pH information prior, you would probably note that these are 
a couple of sectors that I've picked out. That red lime acidic stuff to the east, uh, lentils can't really handle um, early growth, but the wheat comparatively um, is doing okay. So we know wheat's quite um, tolerant to, and it's particularly current variety is quite tolerant to pH. Um, another area where the lentils is performing poorly and the, the wheat relatively a little bit better uh, is that central bit where that red um, dirt pokes out. So just ignore that red patch for the wheat in 2019. That's a natural trial, the trial of bronze. It's obviously been sown a bit later. Uh, grain yield maps, again, another layer to uh, pick out our, our zones, matching with NDVI, matching with our Google Earth. What's the relationship with NDVI and grain yield? Um, just very simple. This is what we can pull out of a grain yield map. Um, an example from the Mallee this year, so not great yielding, but the variation is huge. So um, what's that doing to our um, implications of, of management with, with nutrient interactions and, and offtake? So um, the grain dots here generally are nearly up to two tonne, uh, moving through the colours, the warmer colours of the poorer grain yield um, yeah, grain yields, so yeah, down to even less than half a tonne. So immediately to me, if I was looking and had the budget and had time, uh, you try and pick out your good production areas. Uh, that's spot one, potentially an intermediate um, and matching with an NDVI zone two. Um, a very, very important to pick out your, your poor um, performing parts of the paddock. So um, for me, can we actually fix this economically? Is it as a nutrient? deficiency that we can actually um, get a handle of, or is it actually a soil constraint that that is really hard, subsoil constraint that's really hard to, to actually manage and, and it's gonna to cost too much, so feed less, I guess. Um, so very important. And again, comparing good two good production areas um, with 0.4 and then you know, obviously going a bit nuts, but um, again, another poor performing central part of the paddock and maybe an intermediate one along that same run line. So um, immediately we've got six, which is probably um, enough, but that sort of spatial information across there will show, hopefully give us a really good information on uh, soil sampling and manage, management into the future. Uh, importantly, grain yield maps uh, can be used for nutrient removal. So um, this is the, just the generic rules of thumb of nutrient, important nutrient removal. So this is kilogram per tonne of grain for the ver various um, crop types. Um, so we can actually use a grain yield map to actually replace that with with that rule of thumb um, of nutrient removal and um, I guess replacement packages are if you are on that system. I guess if we are on replacement and moving into VRT, these removals are going to be very, very different across this paddock. Um, it's not uncommon to get this variation. So just an example for this year, um, that sort of two tonne per hectare, we're removing up to 45 kilograms of nitrogen six kilograms of P if we move to the poor performing areas. Again, really important to define why it's uh, performing poorly, but that's gone down to 10 units of nitrogen and uh, less than two, uh, two kilos of P. So very much different offtake off our paddock. So how do we actually manage that? What's that done with residual nutrient levels? So a couple of uh, resources moving into the future. Our, our headers are improving with technology and we're being able to start looking at grain uh, protein maps. Uh, so uh, this is acknowledgement Ed Scott um, from the GRDC updates. Um, some neat example of actually matching um, protein levels off our paddocks with uh, soil sampling. So this is a site from New South Wales. Um, variation of protein on the left. So we've got sort of in the 12s to even 13s on the northwest corner. Um, down to about 10% uh, proteins in, in that bottom right section. So um, going in the next, prior to the next season to in March, 2020, um, deep soil profiling nitrogen um, matched pretty nicely the, the variation of protein. So where we had the high proteins, we had the high nitrogen supply uh, profile N. Um, and in fact, through that bottom section had low proteins, but low profile N. So immediately that's seemingly, uh, we've got a poor efficiency area, so high profile nitrogen, um, high protein, potentially lower yields, what's driving that? Um, comparatively, we've got lower protein, potentially higher production in that lower section, leaving lower nitrogen banks um, behind. Um, that's probably worth feeding. Um, and that's obviously without any grain yield information. So really important for don't forget to grain yield maps between these layers. So protein 
by grain yield will actually give you obviously a nitrogen content will give you nitrogen removal of kilograms per hectare so um really if we're looking at nitrogen banks which has been a popular topic um yeah we can actually look at nitrogen in, in a removal and replacement type strategy in spatially across our paddocks and that's yeah obviously refining our soil sampling strategies going into the next year This was another, uh, Michael mentioned EM38. So petrol ore is big in this space, uh, based on York's. Uh, so Pete's segregated. This is a paddock example um, on your peninsula of segregating conductivity uh, from an EM38 survey into seven classes. So um, quite um, detailed zones there. If essentially, um, I'll keep it brief for this this talk, but Low conductivity will will mean that you've naturally got sandy soil types. Uh, higher conductivity will lend to heavier soil types, clays, and potentially some constraints. So um, this is just an example of setting up zones with, I guess, port plant available water, um, worthy of zones to investigate through soil probing, um, and just how they behave through different seasons. So way back in 2003, um, We've got yeah, a barley crop with a nice sort of even October rainfall, 45 mil. Um, the barley's actually been able to finish off the heavier soil types have been productive and have yielded uh, better compared to the lightest sands. Uh, canola, 2004, the next year, four mil in October is not gonna help anyone. You can see the heavier soils crashing um, in, in that important October period and the sands have actually managed to hang on a little bit more and yield better. So. Um, important considerations for plant available water and obviously, I guess, nitrogen, but all nutrient um, interactions. So I'll just, uh, yeah, obviously, hopefully that's a couple of examples to lead to a pre-season soil, sa soil sampling program that's going to tell you um, about the spatial variability in your paddock. Uh, just you're providing a couple of examples of how we've used this to refine. This is in a phosphorus example. So... Um, acknowledgements to Sam Trangove and his team. Um, this is a, a neat project from Saget looking at variability of phosphorus responses. So again, a paddock in mid-north, uh, a Google Earth image in-season capture. Uh, we can see variations and Sam set out um, those blue points, one, two, three, and four, uh, variations of NDVI performance there. You can see in the middle, so it's a serial production NDVI early 2018. Um, one and two is poor performing, warmer colours, three and four, four is neutral and three is highly productive. So um, Sam's gone around with his Verus machine and those points on the right hand side, you can't quite see one and two, but they're in the alkaline area. So um, might then acidity might be driving poor production in this example and many others um, around the place that the, the actual alkalinity is driving um, early um, poor NDVI captures. So. And three and four is actually uh, sort of neutral to acidic, but they're doing really, really well in a serial phase. Um, if we were to go across, I'll just point those white markers, one, two, three, four. There's a gate down the bottom um, of that paddock to another gate on the long side, which is probably a tra traditional soil sampling program. What actually happens if we collect those cores and amalgamate them as, as per what we normally do? Um, there's another gate in the northern sector. Maybe we might drive along there. What sort of impact does that give um, to, I guess, diluting out this spatial um, variability across this paddock. And again, looking looking at those lines on the on the soil pH, we've got a mixture of acidity into alkalinity. We probably get a pretty good amalgamation in saying this soil is quite neutral, so no real impacts to be had. Um, and if we went to that further, that northern sector, we're probably capturing a lot more of that acidity. So maybe that's telling us that we might need lime, whereas um, half of that paddock probably doesn't. So this was a P example. Uh, Sam threw in four replicated pet phosphorus response trials. Um, and these were, there's partial gross margins in behind this, um, but for this talk, I simplified it and obviously P response trials. Those points one and two in the alkaline sectors um, with residual P from uh, uniform previous applications. Uh, but effectively that's all types driving low P. So co P, in the 20s low for that corresponding quite high PBI in the hundreds and the DGT another marker that's working really well for alkaline soils is is quite low. If we action on these two zones alone and maximize yields with P we're actually getting a benefit of $70 per hectare um, like I said if we were acted on. Points three and four are actually um, slightly acidic 
the P reserves are really, really good. The fixation um, allowing those P reserves is lower. Um, both Coal and P and DGT saying they're sufficient. So we could actually cut back on P if the budgets uh, allowed or were, was, was difficult. Um, and if we actually had this information and lowered our P rates, we could actually um, have some fertilizer savings about five to $10 per hectare. So, but again, like I mentioned, if we did a transect and merged all these zones, um, we quite come back as quite a nice neutral pH. Uh, P and Coal P39 is pretty good. PBI is um, less than 100, um, so we diluted out those high and lows, um, and DGT is not bad. So we probably go, okay, our P is not too bad, and we've missed out those very P deficient zones of, of one and two. So hopefully that's an indication of, um, or an example of how important it is to pick up these spatial, spatially different performing areas. Uh, just some visuals. Uh, again, Sam's done a whole lot of these. I think we're up to nearly uh, 50 individual trials across uh, various paddocks looking at spatial variability of P. This is just another neat example of, of and quite a um, big variation within a paddock. Uh, barley up near Crystal Brook, uh, again, those lower that lower part of this paddock, uh, poor NDVI, bare earth, um, not performing, got alkaline patches. Um, just looking at point, that top photo of that field trial is a P response in that lower part, so that poor performing um, previous um, NDVI map and the bottom right hand corner is point D which we're moving into um, good country and good NDVI signatures and effectively we couldn't see a P response um, compared to NILs so obviously we don't go out with NILs but our yield benefits um, above replacement are up to up to one ton one and a half ton and from the NIL was two ton in that responsive area so again uh, actually that in this um, pretty good grain price season. Um, the return was $300 a hectare, which was quite impressive. And again, um, just moving up to that northern uh, middle section of the paddock, we've, we've got basically a yield increase of zero. So if we're in there, we knew P reserves were good, we could action on it. And the potential re return was $70 per hectare of MAP savings um, by cutting down on um, normal district practice rates. And I'll just finish with, I guess, this is all about soil mapping and um, data collection. Grid mapping uh, is becoming popular, is popular. Um, I guess just some comments on, on zones versus grid sampling. Um, again, grid sampling, whether it's on a hectare or two hectare, I've done a 70 hectare paddock here as an example. Costs about 2,000 for a one hectare grid, 1,000 for a two hectare grid, and a pretty limited uh, analysis package because we've got so many samples. So pH cations, coal P is quite popular. Just some pros on my behalf. Uh, Pro spatial information is high. Um, pH really good for for defining our where where we need to put our lime, and we've got some valuable cation information. The cons very rarely do we do a PBI with coal P, which is really really important. Surface samples we don't have a well rarely do we have an indication of constraints, um, and obviously no nitrogen information. So. Moving on to using those data layers that I've just shown, and maybe for $2,000 uh, approximate pricing, we could do five zones and four depths or 10 zones by two depths. And that will give us profile and plant available water constraints, all nutrients. We're doing the full package. Um, some cons, I guess, um, debate around whether those five zones would be enough to actually quantify all those spatial um, differences within a paddock. But what grid sampling could do, um, and I think potentially what we could shift is start looking at adding a package, say a PBI, which is an inherent soil property, which we actually define because of that spatial information, greater spatial information, we could actually define um, these zonal, um, moving into a zonal um, sampling in the future. So we can actually go back on those spots and accurately look at how our management or our action plan has actually moved our, our nutrient levels. Just a comment for me. And that was it for that section. Thank you. So this was, uh, hopefully it won't take up too much time, um, Some a nice SAGET funded project. It's on your peninsula, apologies, um, but I think it's applicable for definitely areas of Flurio um, and elsewhere. So um, this came from an acknowledgement to Sam Holmes and his team, Central Ag Solutions. This was a neat story of something, a visual we're seeing on the ground and quantifying what was actually happening. So. Um, as the title suggests, we're looking at on-row sowing benefits on Yorks. We can try and look at that elsewhere. I guess, what are the drivers? So um, moving quickly into 
the project, uh, how it started. So this was a visual set, one of Sam's clients, uh, that a, a new boot uh, sewing system with, with a couple of centimetre guidance. Um, on his back, he tried to, this is coastal York Peninsula. Um, you can see um, the map there where we are, it's near Port Victoria. Um, off his own back, he started looking at uh, inter-row sewing. So normal practice is a photo on the left-hand side. He thought, well, I'll try capturing some moisture in or some nutrients and putting the cereal crop basically on the previous stubble row. Um, and what we could quickly find out, the growth patterns and emergence of those two was vastly different. So on row was um, very much improved um, and it converted to roughly off, off the yield mats to about a ton um, per hectare increase by just simply going on to on, on row on the previous crops um, stubble. So Sam was interested to know how the hell or what the hell was going on here. What's the mechanisms behind this? Is it just moisture? And nutrients. Um, so we threw in a few soil cores uh, to identify what was um, happening. That was when you hit the button. Um, and I guess this is this is a common trait of what we're seeing. So um, essentially, the, this data is on and off of a poor and a good area. Um, pH not really affected. Moisture is a little bit of um, difference, but not really in the poor. Nitrates are, are huge in the um, inter-row um, or off sowing line, so it's all throw. Um, peas, not too much different in this case, but salt was the other one, so it's all throw. Surface salt, um, the, yeah, this crop was actually not handling that extra salt, so we've gone from in that poor area 0.74 to 1.7 by simply changing or going back on the sowing line, um, which was important. So how does that actually quantify into... Um, visuals, so we threw in, put a project up, um, thanks to Sega for funding it, and looked at, I guess, phosphorus was important on on-row sowing and immobility of it and whether we we're picking up um, extra phosphorus by doing on-row. So essentially we threw two replicated trials in 2022, barley and lentils. Um, we looked at sowing position, so on and off, and five phosphorus rates is just a simple response trial and then swapped them this year. So lentil went on to barley and barley went on to lentil. So just some visuals of uh, this year. So the lentils um, off-row plus ferts, you can see the left-hand effect there. And by simply just sowing the seed on road uh, without any fert, you can see the, the benefit there of, of better crop establishment and vigor. Um, and the barley one on the left-hand, sorry, on the right-hand side, an example of uh, a P response of both on row sowing. So we are getting, um, this is phosphorus um, hungry ground and uh, we're getting really nice visuals of, of phosphorus response as well. So uh, these are soil properties for the, for the gurus of, of um, soil interpretation. Um, site one in the first year and site two um, in the second, sorry, lentil site two in the first year. Uh, Effectively, the same traits as I showed before. There's a slight moisture benefit, as you expect, on the on-row sowing. Um, nitrates elevated in the off-row. Um, but again, not much pea interaction. Um, quite similar, not not significant. And the salt was the big one. So um, EC1 to 5, obviously you can do the conversion to ECSE. Um, but the salt in the off-row compared to the on-row was um, remarkably higher. So... Um, site two was worse, 3.33 to 1.24. It's a massive difference when we're looking at a um, seed trying to emerge in that environment. So what actually happened, this was site one. So this is the lower EC site. Um, so again, 0.28 on, uh, 0.45 off. We sort of look at a threshold of 0.6 for cereals. Um, essentially, yeah, sowing on row, maximise yields and maximise the performance of, of phosphorus implication or phosphorus application. So um, again, phosphorus deficiency, um, actually, yeah, we're maximising grain, grain yields on, on row at about 20 units of P. By sowing into row with that extra salt effect and I guess reduced moisture, um, yeah, the efficiency of, of phosphorus at, at those three intermediate rates is, is, is quite a lot lower. And again, the biggest difference there was in grain yield was up to a ton at that 20 units of P. So um, for the stats people, uh, the overall stats on row versus inter row combining the P rates was uh, increased yield of about half a ton. Um, and obviously a significant phosphorus response there as well. Uh, the lentil site on the higher EC, we know lentils are susceptible to pH. I think they're susceptible to, to salt compared to cereals as well. 
Um, this is 1.25 on, 3.3 off. Uh, essentially, when we added FERT um, early on, any FERT actually was a negative effect. The grain yield bounced back a bit, but again, we had this on-row um, and off-row effect of, of translating to grain yield. So about 0.4 um, tonnes benefit uh, without any FERT and um, really, really hindering the P response um, of that presence of that that salt as well. So again, pulling out the stats, um, pretty much combining all those P rates, yeah, benefit of, like I said, about 0.4 tonne in its lentils. So this year, this is hot off the press. So this is data from Sam coming through last week. Um, so sorry, no stats to this, but um, that's like one lentil and barley. So that lower salt, um, the lentils, as I mentioned before, just seem to be quite sensitive to, to salt. Um, so on row, again, we've gone on row and on row. We've got a second year benefit of up to 20 um, units of P on row. As soon as we added any type of FERT, so 10 per units of P, we've started to crash a lentil system um, by that elevated salt in the off, off row. So quite a few differences in, in kilograms, um, or sorry, tons per hectare for that lentil again. So we've backed it up. Um, the barley on lentils, so you remember the lentils crashed, um, but in this year that the barley potentially um, can handle a little bit more salt, um, the higher salt site. So we're getting a nice, really nice pea response. Again, pea utilization on row sowing. Uh, off row, we're getting a pea response, um, but it's just a, that increment lower, um, whatever pea rate you look. So between say 0.2 and up to 0.6 tons per hectare. So it has repeated. So um, just some quickly, we did a quick survey of how um, extensive this was. I know this is York, sorry, but it'd be really nice to look at the fluoro area with this um, and surface salt areas. I don't expect you to see all those numbers, but the off row on the on the of salt on the left hand side was um, substantially higher on the on row um, comparison in that right hand um, survey picture. So um, a lot more reds and oranges, and I reckon the oranges for lentils will um, needs to decrease because we actually don't have too much guidelines of salt tolerances of lentils and, and other pulses that we're growing in our environment. So much like acidity, I don't think the lentils can handle too much salt as well. So yeah, finishing off, I guess the question was what are, what are the drivers? Um, moisture, obviously, of on row surface salt, which we encountered. So anything, any part of the paddock that we might end identify that's not performing and potentially got elevated salt, where's the salt in our profile? Can we look at on row sowing? Um, adding more salt as a fertilizer to moderate, moderate or elevated soil salinity levels will reduce crop performance. Um, and both the combination increase moisture and decrease salt um, actually helps um, utilize pea sources or the, the crop to utilize pea sources importantly in pea deficient scenarios. And I guess what other questions? It would be nice to expand this in other areas, but how long does the on row sowing um, effect last? Um, two seasons so far. Um, like I mentioned, what are the pulse thresholds for soil salinity compared to cereals? And I guess looking at fertilizer and the impact that had um, near the seed, what's the best management option for low pea soils in a pulse cereal rotation on these soil types? So I'll leave it there and hopefully that was of some benefit. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Some really interesting research happening there. We'll keep moving on to Brian Hughes from Persa, who is going to run through considerations for soil health in Plurio. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, uh, Brian Hughes here, just uh, talking about uh, considerations for soil health, uh, particularly aligned to the uh, Fleurio part of the Malafie Ranges. Um, I should acknowledge for this talk that Amanda Chappell and Andrew Harding have, have, have uh, assisted me getting and using some of their material. I also need to acknowledge uh, David Mashman, who, who I've, I've taken some of his um, uh, slides that you'll, you'll see about the soil types. Um, I suppose in terms of soil health, um, a lot of interest in, in you know, can we improve soil health, uh, its function in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas issues. And, and uh, generally, I suppose this, this talk will focus on um, looking at um, components of that, of that uh, in terms of the physical, chemical, biological stuff. Um, we'll also look at you know, limitations certain soils have in terms of natural or induced limitations. And... I'll be talking more from a, an agricultural land use type perspective. So, you know, optimizing production, uh, carbon capture, 
nutrient and water movement. There, there are other uses you can make of soils, but, but for my end, it's more looking at the agricultural thing. And I wanted to sort of define soil health a bit first, um, talk about the fluoro and the limitations some of the soils have, um, look at you know, some of the testing options for, for different components of soil health, and we'll talk a bit about, about, bit about carbon as well. Basically, if, if you look at soil health, uh, it's the capacity of the soil to function as a, as a living system in relation to its natural capacity. So um, when we look at a healthy soil, it's, you know, from an agricultural perspective, it's got to be profitable. It can be resilient against uh, uh, dry conditions or wet conditions. Um, can have a, a productive uh, sort of biological aspect in it. It may have some environmental qualities and it needs to be from a plant, animal and human health perspective, it needs to be something which is producing good quality produce and not creating other issues. Um, there's no universal sort of soil health benchmarks. Um, and as I said before, you know, what's defined as healthy for an agricultural system is different to, to that in a natural ecosystem. The five key functions that the soil provides, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, certainly uh, important in terms of growing plants and, and capturing CO2, water, water moving through the soil uh, and nutrients cycling and moving through the soil and, and plants being able to get hold of those. Um, it's the soil is very much, I suppose, um, uh, where the biological activity occurs, and you know, it is an energy source for, I suppose, biological activity and the benefits that you get from those in terms of soil structure. The last one, I suppose, to mention here is, you know, what's its role in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation? Um, a lot of that stuff's captured by the plant, but a lot is also released back into the atmosphere, and a lot of interest in, you know, can we capture more? Soil, generally speaking, is is made up of a range of particle size so you have things like gravel sand which is around that sort of um, two millimeters i suppose in size you know it's the silk component which is much smaller again the clay component which is which is you know like two microns in terms of size and and in addition to those you have organic matter um, air and water and in, in some sort of parts you also have, have lime or natural carbon calcium carbon either in part of the profile or, or the profile and you know, soil is a precious resource. You know, figures around of taking a hundred years to create one centimetre of soil, probably longer in some cases for South Australia. So when we're looking at um, uh, soil in terms of the the, uh, we're aiming to sort of be able to characterise a particular soil to assess it against benchmarks um, uh, or criteria. And and I suppose the um, there's, a, there's a range of sort of basic tests there that you can look at. Some of these you can do yourself. So things like soil texture, soil colour. The depth of layers is always very important in South Australian soils, understanding the, the full pH of all those different layers as you go down. Then looking at, you know, where, where do the roots go in a soil type? Um, how deep do they go? Are they restricted by a certain layer? And understanding the constraints of why that happens uh, are all things that we can look at and try and improve our soil type. Limitations to fluoro soils, broadly speaking. Um, so, you know, things like... Um, pH and acidity is, is one of the historic ones where we've seen, um, for a number of reasons, I suppose, uh, acidification of soils that were partly acid when they were, they were cleared, and, and acidity has been a major issue through much of the many of the soil types in the fluoro. Erosion and gully risk are, are also quite um, significant, in, 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 and things like landslips uh, in some regions. Drainage issues, so waterlogging can be an issue on certain soil types. So some some are shallow over rock or, or calcrete. Um, there are some sandy areas where things like water repellency and infertility happen because of the very coarse nature of the soil. And then there's other soils, such as the ironstone soils, where, where things like, like phosphorus fixation occurs due to that high level of ironstone in them. So that's some of the limitations. You probably think of more as you go. Just running through some of those soil types, um, Sandy loam over brown clay is sort of one, one of the soils that we'd say uh, occurs particularly in uh, on the slopes uh, and the flats through the soil. Clay can be quite dense at the bottom and, and it has you know issues, I suppose, this one with it has moderate inherent fertility. Uh, the clay loam versions are better than the sandy loams. can be poorly drained if it's in the right, wrong location, um, but it has quite a good water holding capacity and can, can be quite erodible. And just these little graphs are really examples of where those soil types occur um, through the region. So this one, yeah, quite well, well spread, I suppose. Um, I'll just go through a few of these. The uh, sand over clay, so a much sandier topsoil. 
up to 80 centimetres thick, you know, very common in, in the places like Eamon Valley um, and um, over a sort of sandy clay, loamy clay substrate can go through to sandstone around Mount Compass. You see some of those, these areas too where, where it goes through to the, the sandstone underneath up, up in the rises. Um, a much lower inherent fertility uh, range of drainage depending on its location where the clay layers occur can have a significant acidity problems and and expose, you know, it is quite water pellet and can be in some cases exposed even to wind erosion uh, in our region. The, the next one, which which is, occurs isolated through, through Mount Compass um, and some patches of it, I suppose, through the Fleurie, is, is what we call the deep sand. Uh, and I've included the, the pod soil in this, I suppose, which is which is probably the the very low in fertile soil, probably the, the least fertile soil of the lot. Uh, can be excessively drained, um, very acid and prone to acidity and has water plants and wind erosion problems. So it's a very thick, deep sand, very bleached, and often you you can overlie a sandy clay or, or coffee rock or sandstone in some cases. Um, tends to occur on the flats or slopes, and uh, where it is, it's probably uh, uh, not that widespread, but certainly where it is, it is a very infertile soil, um, but an interesting one, that's the same. Um, ironstone soil, which very common in the in the uplands of the power area, I suppose, the flat crests and the and the upper slopes and and sort of on on the caps of the ridges, but also has moved down the slopes a bit. So sandy loam to sandy clay loam surface, just abundant ironstone gravel, over a sort of yellowy brown clay, often get quite kaolinized clay at depth. While it's you know it's a reasonably good looking soil, there are issues with the fertility linked to the uh, presence of the ironstone gravel, which means that things like phosphorus get get um, uh, fixed into an insoluble form. Um, it's imperfectly drained, can, so drainage can be an issue, um, but yeah, has, has quite a good water holding capacity. And again, we see acidity as, as a major issue on this one, can extend into the subsurface. I suppose, again, quite common in the, in the Fleurio and along the edge of the range is, is this next one, which is really a loamy soil uh, over uh, either clay and and getting down to rock. So common on the ridges, off, often find you into some weathered, weathered rock, within a, certainly within a metre on this one. Uh, quite a moderate fertility, um, reasonable world drain, quite high, high water holding capacity. And um, But again, acidity can be an issue and it can be quite erodible. And you know, when my days at lens with this is a sort of soil they particularly like growing grapes and things, uh, grapes and uh, um, apples on. Um, a sandy version, a bit similar. So again, a, a sand, a sandy line over clay, often over rock within a metre. So similar sort of things, highly erodible and, and acidity are often issues with this soil, not quite as fertile as the last one. And then, yeah, lots of shallow stuff around, I suppose, which you probably know some of the issues of that one. Um, wet soils, are quite common through the flu as well. Uh, and these these are um, prolonged wood logging, uh, can be marginally saline or, or, or can can be more of a peat soil where, where it's accumulating organic matter. And, and these are a really high ecological value, these soils. There's a, there's a lot of um, interest in whether, you know, things like peats, whether, whether we can store more carbon in them. You know, where they've been drained, they, they, they get into production. But I think in most cases now, many of these areas have been fenced off into, into sort of natural swamps, very prone for, for, for gulling or stream bank erosion where they've been disturbed. And as I said, a potential sort of sink for carbon. And I think I'll probably flick through these other ones really are more linked to the Wollonga and places like that. So so some of the, along, along, along the edge of the hills where they've got uh, calcareous bits through the profile, in this case is you know, quite a heavy sort of loam over over limestone, and I suppose the uh, similar sort of uh, soils on the edges of the, uh, the, the western and, and uh, particularly the northwestern side of the ranges where you've got lime in the profile um, over over rock, the deep sort of redder limes. Now these there are some of these in the in the sort of yank sort of area down down in the uh, uh, the old glacial valley there, and that sort of a loamy surface over red clay and some lime as you go down through the profile, prone to gully erosion, but you know, quite fertile and high water holding capacity. Cracking clay is again common in some of the um area, but also down through through Yank, 
high inherent fertility can be quite sticky when wet very high water holding capacity but are very susceptible to things like landslip and gulling on their own um, slopes and you know some of the examples of issues that i've raised so, so the high ph and low ph so this this is a uh, graph by trog where it talks about you know soils become more acidic things like uh, phosphorus potassium sulfur calcium magnesium and the one that we particularly see molybdenum will become less available uh, and you, you have these trace and, and other become uh, nutrient deficiencies occurring as, as soils become more alkaline you, you know, copper zinc manganese and iron are probably more, more the things that you see is becoming deficient uh lancet the torrens vale um dispersive clay it, i'll talk a bit about dispersive clays as we go you know, as we put some soil in into some distilled water and just see how much i suppose the, the, the pad becomes milky um, so running through slight dispersion here moderate dispersion and then very high dispersion on the bottom on the right hand side there and that's what happens in reality that that clay disperses those bits of clay come out of the the matrix and clog up all the pores on the right is really a lime response in clover at the weight just showing even at the weight institute they ran into an acidity problem so improving and testing soil health in the fluorio so I've been through understanding the limitations and you know whether they're economic to, to treat some of those and we'll talk a bit about improving carbon and microbial activity as we go so in terms of the soil health you know chemical physical and biological are those sort of components we always talk about the chemical stuff really relates to the um you know source and sufficient nutrients for plants that cannot exchange uh, what the ph is you know are the phs in a healthy zone are there low toxicities uh, of some of the other nutrients the physical stuff is very much about the the structure of the soil can that structure allow air and water to move through it can roots can move through it and the biological stuff is really talking about you know have you got a, a diverse and an active bi biological component is there lots of a food source for that biology to work can, can you have these sort of disease suppressant type um species occurring there that suppress some of the diseases and and so so initially i talked about you know optimizing the production of food or fiber um and if you're intending to sort of um look at the i suppose that um, a good healthy soil one of the aspects that you know if you're optimizing your food or production uh, are you getting as much production out of it uh, is one of the measures you've got so in terms of the yield the dry matter uh, the ndvi you know the, the, the amount of livestock growing on that but these are all measures of how productive it is there are sort of yield potential models particularly suited to cropping but there, there are partial versions of those where you can compare your rainfall and, and just see where you're at in terms of the productive capacity um the, the second bit there is really looking at the, the water uh, movement within that soil you know can we improve the soil structure for better infiltration and storage um and there's some sort of simple methods of you're just looking at the soil structure itself if it's a nice little pea-sized shapes you often have a good structure if it's coming out in big blocks of concrete you know you haven't <laughs> and so you know having a look at that, that size and arrangement the stability of the aggregates um you can measure water infiltration uh using, using a, a basic infiltration ring which is centered here just seeing how quickly it goes in and comparing different soils or you can measure you know the strength of the soil and, and density of it um so in this case it's looking at the uh, fixed volume and, and how much soil and what's the weight of that soil in there you know the heavier that that amount of soil is the denser it is the less poor pores there are and and you've got limitations and and above a certain level roots don't like it too much um on sandy soils you, you can also look at things like penetrometer resistance um pushing in penetrometers measuring the, the strength as the soil as you go down in this case here you've got once once it gets over about 2500 you, you've got an issue with with the soil being too strong for root growth um and an example of your peninsula here is just showing you know, the responses to deep ripping inclusion ripping and spading i suppose in, in, a, in a soil a sandy soil in terms of the, the biology and, and i suppose the sort the biological aspects that you know we're really understanding and targeting improve soil biology um that's very popular i suppose in terms of the the a um, lot of interest in this area it's difficult to know the best way of testing the, the soil biology you can sort of start off looking at uh, a visual assessment so there's a range of things from uh, cotton strips to to um 
Nandi's test to putting out toilet rolls and, and seeing how, how active the, the soil biology is in terms of, um, of breaking those things down. Um, the, can you look at, um, uh, the, there's some simple sort of more tests, I suppose, that are around through various labs, either an indicator of food sources um, through to the tests which measure the biological activity. Um, and then in other tests around that will break up some of the main groups. And, and, uh, and I suppose a range of sort of DNA-based ones we're looking at either, either disease uh, or, or having sort of indicators of good soil health, such as you know, certain types of nematodes or something through there. So there's a range of stuff coming in terms of that, that sort of bio biological area, getting a better handle on that. Traditionally, I suppose that the chemical type tests have been the ones which have been um, used quite a bit. Um, and you know, I suppose being, you know, can you improve nutrient cycling and the, the amounts of nutrients that are available to plants, you know, plant or sap tissues that plant tissue is quite well developed in South Australia, particularly good for the, the trace elements and comparing trace elements um, through to some interest in the, in the sap tests around. Um, you know, soil testing has been used for things like pH, organic carbon, major nutrients, um, phosphorus. Um, you know, in this region, I suppose, there, there's a new phosphorus test around, which is DDTP, which is suited for calcareous soils, but most of you guys are on acid soils. But the thing, you, yeah, having a look at this PBI is, is, is a useful tool for you because it tells you how strong is that fixing ability of the, of the uh, of the ironstone remnants in the soil. Um, exchange for cations and cation exchange tests give you a bit of an indication of how fertile the soil is. Um, soil testing for trace elements is probably less developed than the plant testing, but it gives you a bit of a fill. Um, and things like aluminium is a, is a toxic sort of layer uh, as a toxic levels like, you know, boron salt and aluminium are all indicators of, of toxicity. Aluminium linked to acid soils, and that's a, that's a, a good test to, to do in this region as well. Moving on to, I suppose, the um, organic carbon testing. So, you know, with organic carbon testing, I suppose, if we're looking at greenhouse gas mitigation, the aim is to sort of increase all organic carbon where possible. But that's a little bit of a a, a, a problem because we, we expect to have, you know, lots of organic matter and lots of it breaking down, which improves the function of the soil. Lots of, you know, soil biology things are happening, nutrient cycling, water improvement, which is really linked to the, the breakdown of the organic matter. But for greenhouse gases, we want to store it and stop it. So so in some ways, we're, we're trying to move some of that organic carbon to more stable forms. Um, and and that's probably the challenge. Um, Amanda Chappelle did a lot of work looking at some of the past soil testing levels we got from 1990 to 2007. And this is from old soil testing data, so it's all 0 to 10 data. Um, and the interesting thing is the green line is really the pasture soil. So we've actually seen, you know, a slow increase in terms of the the, uh, the level of organic carbon in pasture soils across South Australia. And even in the cropping soils, there's been a slight increase, which is the blue line during this period. Um, we don't really know what's happened since. You know, has it reached some sort of equilibrium? Are our soils are functioning more, so we're still going up? Uh, and, we, you know, the other thing that sort of come in around the end of that period was a lot of no-till for the cropping areas. So, um, and she's been able to develop sort of the ag districts based on an organic carbon will be black 0 to 10, um, split them up based on texture of the soil. And and so these levels here, so if you're up at 75% or higher, it means you're in the top 25% of the organic carbon levels in, in that soil for that texture. So if you're down, you know, less than 25 percent you're down at these levels here yeah in the, in the low end of that and i suppose it gives you a bit of a guide if you've got um you know soil types that are you know above 75 percent you're probably getting close to some sort of equilibrium if, if you're down on the lower end it means you've got a lot more room to move and get that soil up um so opportunity to increase soil organic carbon depends on the organic carbon starting point and the capacity to store more organic carbon um, the soil texture and any, any soil constraints to the inputs, the rainfall, moisture, temperature, you know, which affects the growth and outputs and the uh, decomposition of microbial activity, the ability to grow or, or apply sufficient or, uh, organic carbon inputs. So can you grow enough to make, make them increase anyway? And the last one, which is some work done through CSRO, 
is that ability to supply sufficient nutrition to enable that biomass to transfer into particular organic or humus organic, which are much less, uh, sorry, much more stable forms of organic carbon. And, and there's sort of rough nutrient ratios that kind of curtly came up that you need to have if you want to want to progress into those sort of forms. Um, so improving soil health in summary, improved plant growth, um, managed limitations, understanding the starting point where you are, what capacity you've got to improve, um, improve the soil by adding amendments. So things like clay on water kind of sand or lime, uh, improve the biological activity by adding organic matter or food for the things like, you know, compost, double biochar will all do that and, and certainly reduce or no tillage if you can. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Some interesting research happening in the area. Our last presenter of the day is Oli Magat, who is going to take us through some soil sampling and carbon emission. Over to you, Oli. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Lovely. So I just wanted to, and I'm conscious of time uh, for all of you, uh, just step you through some work that we're doing in partnership with GPSA. So we've partnered up as a part of the National Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge. So this is a, a national challenge that's been set by the federal government off the back of the fact that, you know, currently it is prohibitively expensive for farmers in regions like the Fluio to baseline their soil carbon to the level that they could have real confidence in. So just as that previous presenter, sort of Brian, was sharing about the, you know, the uh, variability um, of our soils down in the, in the Fluio, if, if you were following the current methodology, which is here on the, on the left, where you're just taking physical soil cores and those soil cores um, are just a, a minimum of 38 mil in diameter, and they only have to go down to 30 centimeters. Uh, at the moment, you know, the minimum requirement under the current methodology is that you take nine samples across three sampling areas, but your probability of you getting and uh, having confidence in those results is very low. So that's why people, if they're really wanting to rigorously base on their farms, they have to take a significant amount of samples, which pushes that cost up towards that kind of could be up to $20 a hectare level. Um, and basically there's a realization that that isn't going to scale and we need to bring this cost right down to kind of $3 and less per hectare in order for it actually to make, you know, commercial sense for producers as we're increasingly going to be asked to provide things like our, our, our stocks of our carbon that we're storing in our soils and in our trees. So in soils, we're, we're not trying to advocate to get rid of physical soil sampling, but what we're doing is we are using physical soil samples to help localize a computer model of soil carbon. But that model is fixed against where we do have known data. And the work that we're doing is simply to reduce the density of sampling that's needed over time. So whereas you might need, you know, 30, 40 samples across a typical farm in the fluoro at the moment to rigorously base on it. I might push the cost of like $10,000 plus. Um, how can we get that down to still just using that minimum nine cores, but actually having confidence in those results? So what we have to do, this is very much a data-driven challenge. So we are out there um, working with, actually nearly ends up being 500 farmers, uh, 20,000 soil samples, of which nearly 100 of those are going to be in South Australia. I think we're already working with about 12 producers on the Flurio in different farming systems. Uh, and we are basically stepping each of those farmers through the um, a compliant approach to baselining their soil carbon. And, but we're using that data, making that data available for other researchers and other innovators to go and crack some of these technical challenges we're facing as producers. So just to walk you quickly through the process, um, basically, when you are setting up a, um, a compliant baseline, um, so this is a baseline that would be that would fit within the Australian Carbon Credit Unit framework that we're currently working under. Um, we firstly have to know all of our um, cadastral boundaries. So in the FarmLab platform, I'm going to walk you through. We have the cadastral boundaries of every every land holding in South Australia. So with the farmer, we identify um, which are their um, which are their lot and DP numbers, so all their land title numbers. Uh, we identify those and then we create carbon estimation areas within each of those cadastral boundaries. So this is where we're going to be basically 
uh, baseline in the soil carbon. We then go on a process of um, creating sampling re areas. And there's some tools that we have that can help to drive those areas. So we might use something like NDVI, um, which you know Sean would have touched on earlier, as something to help drive where we should divide up that carbon estimation area. And there's another layer that we can fuse into that called topographical wetness index, which is how the water is going to move over the landscape and often is a good indicator of where higher and lower soil carbon levels will be. So we use these layers in our, in our computer system to basically divide it all up. We also just can modify that working with the landholder to kind of refine it all. And then there is a process that randomly then drops sampling points across that farm. And then we work with actually Amanda Chappelle, who was mentioned in that last presentation, that pairs to do a lot of our sampling here in South Australia. So they then get all of those points shared onto their phones and they navigate accurately to each of those points, take a sample. Uh, on our projects, we either sample to 60 centimeters, if we can get down that deep, or to uh, 100 centimeters. Uh, the minimum requirement for the methodology is that we, we get we can get a sample to 30 centimeters. So when those when those soil cores come up, we measure off the top 30 centimeters. That's our top 30, that's our top soil sample, and then from 30 centimeters down is our subsoil sample. And that all goes off to a lab. Often it's APAL labs. Uh, uh, all those samples are geo-referenced in the field. They go through a process of drying them down over a couple of days um, at the lab. And then once they're all air dried, they then um, oven dried, they then get ground up uh, and we remove any any uh, fractions that are over two mils. So any rocks or or roots get taken out before then it goes through the um, it's called the carbon, it's called the CFI test. So that's the suite of tests that are used to quantify soil carbon. So th they both create the and uh, give us the mass of the soil to create its bulk, the bulk density of the soil. And we also get, we also, the samples also go into a machine called a Nico machine that is to analyze the percentage of um, organic carbon within those soil samples. And then with labs like APAL, they then um, automatically return those results back to our farm lab platform. And then we can then create a report for each of those uh, landholders on what is their current percentage soil carbon. And then we also turn that into stocks as well. So uh, we've got a little farm on uh, near Wollonga in in the, on the Florio. At the moment, in the top thirty centimeters, we are sitting at about one and a half percent carbon. We're on black cracking clay, um, and when you multiply that out by the bulk density, we are currently sitting on about fifty tons of carbon per hectare. So yeah, you get you get that knowledge back, and we will cover all the costs of sampling and lab testing. The basic agreement is that you are, um, we'll cover that if you're happy to then, for us to then share that data back with the Australian government for other people who are researching and innovating in the soil space to be able to use to push this whole challenge forwards. Um, one of our ultimate objectives of what we're wanting to do on places like Kangaroo Island and the Fleurio is to have enough sample points in place so that we can actually, um, as we sample any farm, we can show where those farms sit against the mean of soil carbon in just the fluorio. So we can show you if you're, you know, on a higher or lower spectrum of, of farms in the region. And just wanted to flag up some, um, actually some other quite interesting work that we've just started to do. So we're very much having to, to put in place this data set, which will drive the quantification of soil carbon at a particular time. Um, but also one of the, actually the even bigger challenge is being able to confidently pick up the direction of change over time. So again, as Brian started to, to show, there was, there was data um, in place with PERSA kind of 10, 15, 20 years ago that showed the general trend of soil carbon, uh, typically increasing in the top 10 centimeters. Um, what we're doing is after we've taken those soil samples, we're actually starting on both cropping and livestock paddocks to drop in Basically, they're like a um, soil moisture probe, but they are a probe that is monitoring the fluxes of gases going in and out of those soils. So it's measuring the fluxes of gases of you know, CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane. And it's the combination of the data um, that we produce when we get the lab test results back, and also 
um, the ongoing measurements of the changes in gases going in and out of the soils, which is going to help to inform these models that are modeling out change over time. And actually it's likely to be for us as producers that once we've been baselined, there will be a model which will, will help to credit us. So it will help to um, credit us increasing the stores of carbon in our soils um, incrementally each year based on actual measurements in our soil and other data that we'll be able to, these models will, will be able to get to inform them, um, remote sensing data, climate data. Um, so we, there's a whole ecosystem of people helping to crack this challenge so that we actually are able to know, you know, what is our current stock across a whole region like Fluoro and which direction is it going and where do you as individual farmers fit against the mean in your region? So um, really there's a couple of spots um, still available in our project. So if anybody is interested, um, please go to getfarmlab.com forward slash carbon to register. It should only take five minutes. And um, yeah, really great to be working with, with people on the floor there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Holly. We have now raised the end of our webinar and run out of time for questions, but we'll take any questions or notice if you want to get to email them to, uh, and we'll get back to you offline. Please join me in thanking our presenters this morning, Michael Eyes, Sean Morrison, Brian Hughes, and Ollie Maggett. I would also like to thank Hills and Fluoro Landscape Board for funding this webinar through its grassroots grants program. On behalf of GPSI, I would also like to thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that it has been informative to you. Best wishes for the festive season. Thank you all.